entitled, if you can't tell, Harrisburg Out Loud. Uh, and um, Harrisburg Out Loud, the intersection of movement, memory, orality, and performativity in the city. So to talk a little bit about our purpose, the purpose, or at least this purpose of this paper, the purpose is to produce a foundational document for the Center for Public Humanities Student Fellows Program, uh, from which participating students can draw theoretical and practical concepts, ideas, and examples to further their public research and partnerships. Um, and for those of you who might not know, the Fellows Program is, uh, like Dr. Corey said, a two-year-old program um, that in, uh, encourages collaboration and partnership, um, bridging gaps between Messiah and Harrisburg community. So the, uh, this pur the purpose of my paper is also focused on relationships, uh, specifically between white and black residents um, and uh, in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And um, just to highlight one thing before we keep going, um, focusing mainly on this white and black residents of Harrisburg um, does um, produce a sort of a limitation that we're only, you know, a duality that is not necessarily present. Um, and so I want the people to be aware of that this is the start of sort of continued conversations about um, race relations uh, between our school and Harrisburg as well. So, and also before we go on, recognizing that as a white writer and as a white presenter, um, I have a specific lens that is going to, in some ways, help maybe my research, but also hinder me from fully um, grasping the picture. And so I hope you'll um, forgive me and work with me um, as we talk through this uh, paper. Now this next slide I'm really proud of because I spent a really long time putting it together, so I hope you're all blown away by it. <laughs> this idea of the intersection that I'm using, um, and so here to visualize what's happening in this paper. Um, I'm looking at four, I, I found these four different distinct um, research areas, which I'm calling movement, memory, orality, and performativity. And in the paper, I'm sort of trying to look at how each of these four areas and the theories and um, practical applications can affect the way that the fellows program operates, operating at the intersection of these four distinct areas. So took a very long time and very short time spent on it, but it was worth it. <laughs> this next, so we're gonna begin, we're gonna go through the four different areas, talk about them, and how they apply to the fellows program um, and interactions with um, our community partners. So this first subject is something that Lydia already talked about, so it saves me a little time. I'm using the word movement to talk about population change. Um, in Harrisburg, and Lydia gave you an excellent history, a longer history. I'm mostly intrigued by the protests, the black civil rights protests in the 60s uh, and 70s, which had an enormous impact, like Lydia uh, stated, on as a catalyst sort of for white flight in, in the city. Um, you know, as, as Lydia also mentioned, um, the 60s were a time where the civil rights was a, a major social factor. People, um, you know, and specifically in Harrisburg, years of what uh, she, uh, Lydia and I read the same source, placid ostracism, segregation, this idea of black accommodation um, was all changing and black residents, um, is actually, Dr. King's assassination in 68 was a really big spark for this. Um, and black residents, um, decide, you know, they protested, they boycotted, sat, you know, they hosted sit-ins in res uh, restaurants and stores that were discriminatory. Um, and these actions inspired, um, were a catalyst for white flight, um, which I sort of defined in my own words as this idea that when minority groups step out of socially constructed boundaries, geographically, you know, they, they start to, uh, minority people start to move into new neighborhoods. Orally, they start speaking out. Um, politically, etc. cetera, um, wealthy, generally white citizens relocate to other areas, often outside of the city, and Lydia, uh, Lydia really highlighted that. Um, so, and 
we don't need to spend a whole lot of time on these statistics since Lydia already talked about them. But essentially what we're talking about now is a population of Harrisburg that's 30% white and over half of the population in Harrisburg is black. And you can see how in the 19, 1900s, 90% of the population is white and 60% difference by the time we get to the 2000s. So a radical change. Uh, but in order to understand maybe why this um, white flight response, but also a furthering of racial divide by, you know, already people are divided, but then to add ge you know, geographical divide as well, um, can be understood by the next um, avenue in our intersection analogy, which I'm calling performativity. Performativity is different than somebody getting up on a stage and performing Shakespeare. When I mention performativity, I'm really talking about identity performance. Um, and this idea of performing our identities, um, really, there's a groundbreaking series of lectures uh, by a man named J.L. Austin in 1955 at Harvard, in which he stated that what he called speech acts were, had this ability to construct identities. And so the example of a married, um, you know, a, a couple, when they say, I do at a wedding, that statement, I do, isn't describing anything. It's solidifying a new identity for the couple. Um, years later, Judith Butler takes this and says, that's all well and good, and speech acts are a very important part of it. But in order for a married couple to know what it is to be married, there is some social expectation uh, surrounding that identity formation. Um, and so moving then to um, race. Um, race as a socially constructed idea can also be thought of in uh, performance, um, you know, in this performance um, theory. Um, and specifically, black performance theory talks about how um, race, a, a performance of racial identity is performed in response to um, the social expectations placed on that person. So, um, you know, when you're talking about, and here's the quote right here, um, black identity, if black identity is constructed and articulated by those outside of the race, then performances of blackness are created in response, in response, very important uh, phrase, to these imagined identities as well as to cultural retentions in Africanist histories. And so this, this responsiveness of performance identity is something that's often misunderstood by white majority um, people groups and their social expectations that they place on um, black people and black identity. So when you look at um, years of placid ostracism, years of segregation and, and silence, um, and this black accommodation um, idea that Lydia brought up, um, to the 60s where black um, residents are responding differently to this social expectation, um, rising up, acting in a new way, saying things like uh, expressing pride in blackness. These are all expectations that white majority groups are not necessarily um, comfortable with. It's a different, it's defined that expectation and creating, and thus white flight occurs, creating a larger divide. Um, now we move on to the third avenue, which um, I call it orality. And orality, just like J.L. Austin talked about this idea of speech acts as being very important to a construction of identity, um, orality is essentially um, a culture's reliance on verbally transmitting stories, history, and culture from one generation to another. Um, generally in Western society, Western societies tend to place more emphasis on written um, history, written stories, transmitting um, yeah, through the written word, um, whereas globally many cultures have placed that emphasis on oral um, expression. And um, Michael Eric Dyson talks about how orality is a central part of African American culture um, that kind of stretches back pre-transatlantic slave trade to um, West African oral traditions. Um, and if you want to hear, we want to talk more about that, come to my presentation on May 3rd. It's going to be, we're talking about 
West African oral traditions and um, hip hop music, and it'd be very interesting. So, uh, just a little plug. Uh, but um, and, and Michael Eric Dyson also talks about how this oral form, oral modes of expression are um, crucial to cultural and racial identities of groups of people. Um, but on the other side of this coin, oral expression has historically been undervalued, restricted, repressed, marginalized um, by people, generally Western groups in power, who praise written words over oral expression. But what also what's so interesting in this is um, Eric Dyson also talks about how white slave owners often demanded enslaved Africans to um, perform orally for them in singing songs or telling uh, little uh, fables, riddles, um, and the social expectation that also comes from that, that this, the enslaved Africans are not allowed to say anything but what the, the, the master says because the enslaved person's life would depend on that. So the social expectation, again, um, to speak a certain way, to say a certain thing that you also see throughout Harrisburg's history. Um, and so then an emphasis on morality can be a means of empowerment for groups of people who generally feel voiceless or feel like um, they cannot uh, fully express themselves uh, freely. And finally, the last avenue we're talking about is memory. And I bring up memory because orality and memory are so closely tied to one another. You can't really express the stories and histories of, your, uh, of, a, of a people group if you don't have some memory or hist of that history. Um, but also what's so interesting about memory is that this guy, uh, this guy Frederick C. Bartlett talks about remembering something as an act of construction um, in conjunction with present stimuli. I think usually we think of remembering and memory as reproduction of past events. Um, but this radical change is, is this idea that you know, you're walking with your friend or you're talking with a friend, friend mentions something, that snaps you back to an earlier period in your life, and then you bring that early, p earlier period in your life to the present as you explain that um, to your friend. Um, and when you're speaking about these memories, it's, it, it has to be your individual memories, but also like what was going on at that time? Who was speaking with you? What were the overarching social ideas? Um, context comes along with you when you express your memories and construct them in the present. And in this, uh, with this, in this idea of memory um, as a construction in the present can be a catalyst for social action. Um, and I'll speak about that very quickly as well. Memory, obviously then, as I've stated, is linked to history. You're, you're constructing your historical narrative in the present. Um, and like Lydia emphasizes, oral history, speaking, uh, people telling verbally their experiences. Um, this performance of the oral history is in itself, of itself a transformational process. Um, bringing the past into the present um, reveals a lot of how the past um, informs this present. And particularly this is important in a context like Harrisburg, um, where generally Harrisburg, you know, working with the Fellows Program for a couple of years, something we talk about a lot is how Harrisburg's archives, Harrisburg's history is not well kept and not well maintained. Um, and also, too, several of the middle schools in Harrisburg don't have the proper funding to teach history in their classes. Um, and so middle schoolers are graduating without a knowledge of history. We, we did a, a Poetry in Place project, and um, one of the kids, honestly, just, it just I think this kid was, um, well, obviously he was in middle school, and he asked one of the fellows, who, honestly, who Abraham Lincoln was. And not that Abraham Lincoln is like the person to remember, you know, but this idea that um, there's something missing, that this Civil War history, what's going on surrounding Lincoln and, and emancipation and all of that is missing from these students at a very young age. Um, and so, encouraging people who've lived in Harrisburg to express their memories, express history, can change um, the way we view our place and our situations in the present by listening. 
So, okay. Now that we've gone through all of that, we're at the intersection. Finally, we're here. Um, and I wrote a lot of text here, and I'm just going to read it. Um, so, this uh, constructing memories orally in the present, then, it brings new social implications and expectations. Um, you know, we, we begin to look at things differently now that we have a new informant. Um, that if accepted by both sharer and listener, they can alter both individual and communal identity performance. Um, thus, this new identity performance in both black um, and white communities has the possibility of enacting positive socio-political change in Harrisburg and beyond. I like that, and beyond, very effective. Um, <laughs> but then also, specifically for the fellows, by interacting with the oral and physical manifestations of identities and perceptions of society and history they are founded on, the fellows programs can begin to bridge gaps caused by ostracism, segregation, and white flight. Um, this work is both empowering for the people who share their stories as well as the people who listen to them, and has positive transformational implications for everyone involved. Uh, so now, just as some examples, I, I'm going to play a couple of clips. Um, particularly, Dr. Corey mentioned the um, the uh, I'm trying to figure this out here. Let's see. If I can't get it to play, I'll just talk about it. But. It came up just a second. It did? Oh, great. Um, of course, the thing's not good. Well, I just wanted to show some um, examples of how this intersection of all of these different areas um, come to fruition in the work that the Fellows Program has done so far. And I didn't want to show the whole trailer. But it looks like um, that's all I can do. Um, this was a documentary we put together um, that Dr. Corey was talking about. Um, and essentially, the, the goal of the project was to capture the oral histories of uh, the Harrisburg Giants, which was the first integrated American Negro League baseball team in the East. Um, and, you know, these Giants are in their late 80s the mid-90s, elderly men, um, bl black and white um, players who, you know, radically integrated in the 1950s. Um, and we wanted to capture this history while they were still alive and, and per, um, put it into the film. Um, and I'll just, I'll just play a little bit of it. Not very much, but... The Harrisburg Giants started uh, around 1890 by Colonel Struthers. Initially, his team was made up of local ball players, but in the 1920s, his team had started making money, and he went out and he purchased players such as uh, Oscar Charleston and Dixon and the Fats Jenkins and so forth. Throughout their period, 24 to 27 in the Eastern Coast League. They did have the second best record in the So Harrisburg never won the pennant, but they did have the second best cumulative record, and they had a lineup that included two Hall of Famers, Oscar Charleston and Ben Taylor. Whenever the black teams were playing exhibition games against white teams or anybody else, the two players they tried to get in terms of picking up were Oscar Charleston and John Beckham and Curl Starters had both on his regular payroll. We don't have time to watch the whole thing. I I wish I had, I wish I could have controlled that a little bit more so we could have listened to the actual players um, talking about their experiences. Um, but we had the chance to show a trailer like this at an MLK Day, I think it was a service day event where they also were giving out awards to community members and they gave awards um, for lifetime achievement to the, the, um, the Harrisburg Giants for their ra ra racial reconciliation in the 50s and to watch, listen to them give a, an acceptance speech of this award and watch the audience leap to their feet to applaud and speak afterward. I mean, it was very obvious that this, um, these oral histories, these, um, you know, impacted the people in the audience. And um, I would hope, and I think the hope of everyone there would be that this, 
this um, story of you know reconciliation um, would be something that um, transforms their perspectives and their actions and identities as well. And I wanted to I want to show some of this as well. This is our poetry in place project. I'm black and I'm proud. Can't nobody turn it around. I came from blacks. Can't nobody change that. My ancestors were black, I think. I feel bad about those who were eaten and killed. Slaves suffered. They were hurt. I'm so glad I'm living now. I'm a person that will belong to the eye of chains. Who am I? I'm creative, but will never be outspoken. Who am I? I'm the North Star that is known for children. Who am I? I the next generation of history. I am the Civil War Star. I am the Pimpico Virgin Soldier. Who am I to ask? I am the Rose King that passed the other. I am the Civil War History. I okay. And um, just last thing, I know I'm running out of time. Um, but these students wrote these poems. Um, in response to, um, they, they, we, we went to the Civil War Museum, um, a poet, Miss Marion Dornell, was there, spoke about her memory and her, um, you know, poetic identity, and the students um, at the intersection of these four areas wrote poems, performed them at Messiah, and um, impacted, I mean, certainly, I can speak for myself, had a huge impact on me. Um, and I wanted to put this poem up because I think about this poem all the time. Um, yeah. And I don't know, I guess I could read it, uh, you know, and then close with that. Um, think about how this poem operates at the intersection of memory, history, performing new identities, um, and um, expressing yourself orally. Um, so, I Am Abraham Lincoln by Anthony Rivera. I am Abraham Lincoln. I want peace during wars. It was a terrible battle as the men and women fought. That is, until Lee gave up. I celebrated the end of the war by taking my wife and friends to see a play. That is where I was shot. Now the images of the terrible war haunt me. Slavery has ended, but violence continues in Harrisburg. Even the little children are exposed to it. A little boy heard gunshots next to his house. He has even heard some while he was sleeping. He is scared. I know he is, but I can't protect him. I am that boy. I live where it is unsafe. I have heard gunshots next to my house. I have heard gunshots while I was sleeping. I have seen a man walk out of his house with a gun. A boy that lived next to me was shot. All I heard was pow, pow, bang. I was too frightened to move. I am Abraham Lincoln. I want peace. I wish for peace. that we had you presenting together because as localized and grounded as yours felt, Lydia, in terms of that really deep history, um, you brought in so much theory to ask us to think about that history um, in, in really different and really, really important ways. Um, one thing I want to know more about, which I think comes out of Jean's introduction to a sense, was your, your process of getting to this intersection, um, whether one of the roads led you there, you thought you were doing a project on memory, you thought you were doing a project on orality, performativity, um, and ended up discovering these other, other intersecting um, theoretical frameworks, um, or if you discovered them sort of simultaneously and you're plopped down into the middle of the intersection. Um, so I'd love to hear you talk a little bit more at some point about your your um, method, the, the thinking that you did that maybe didn't feel incredibly productive at the beginning, but got you ultimately to, to that intersection. Um, I think the takeaway for me, in many ways, is, is this poem. Because what I'm seeing here is the way Anthony, our poet, is so seamlessly moving between the first person, 
and, and his personal moment in, in Harrisburg and that past. And to think about the way um, for certain voices, maybe for, for children, there isn't that divide, that barrier um, in the same way. But he can move from, from one stanza to the next. I'm Abraham Lincoln, I'm this little boy, I'm Abraham Lincoln, and it's all, all um, woven together. He has to see himself through uh, the history, and the history becomes, becomes the present. Um, I, I think the insistence on first person here is either a, a wonderful technique of the teacher who assigned it, or the fellows who, you know, is this an I am poem? Did everybody have the I am? But even when you were showing the clips of the, of the students, they're speaking about themselves, even as they're speaking about, about history. So that's one really valuable way, I think, to enter your intersection um, that, you've, that you've offered for us. Um, but yeah, I would love to hear you, the two questions I have for you, I want to hear you talk a little bit more about your process, your method, how you got to this intersection. And then if you don't mind, can you actually go back to the intersection slide? Oh yeah, sure. Because he's really proud of it. Yeah. <laughs> oh no, no, I'm so sorry, not the one you're really proud of. <laughs> <laughs> Although it is, take it, it, in, take it, it is in. great. <laughs> the one with all the words on it. With the title, the intersection near the end. Oh, the yes. This yeah, that one. Yeah. Sorry. That's <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, we could definitely talk about the pictures too, right? The uh, movement within the city. The picture you had, where all of the roads are ripped up, right? And the mobility that's limited to the yeah, That's this. <laughs> um, your second bullet point mm. by interacting mm. with the oral and physical manifestations of identities. I want to know more about what it means to interact yeah. as a, an institution, as a college, as a community here at Messiah, as fellows. Um, how does interacting, what does that word uh, do for you? Mm -hmm. How are you thinking about that specifically? Yeah, I think that in the, the scholarship that I, I read, um, Something that appeared, it was actually a, a man named Arnold Rogow, I don't know if anyone knows him. Uh, he wrote a book um, about American cities, and something he talked about was how once a city gets the, um, the title of, or not the title, but the unconscious sort of association of black and city, um, it becomes an area where white residents tend to not want to interact. And this goes back to what Lydia was saying, that crossing the road um, or, you know, staying, or the bridge. Um, and so when I think about interacting, I think about my own experience crossing that bridge for the first time um, in my sophomore year, being here. I took a class um, called Writing for Nature and Travel, and part of the travel writing portion of the course was going, um, I, I decided to write a piece about uh, violence in Harrisburg, and I'm a, a sophomore, and all I know about Harrisburg is it's violent, and so we're gonna you know, write a piece about it. Um, and so uh, my professor, Dr. Walker, uh, introduced me to a friend of hers, an African-American woman who lived in the projects in Harrisburg, and um, I, don't, I mean, I've never been to Harrisburg, period, but also to go to a projects was something completely new for me. And, you know, the interview was, it, it was rough at first because we were, you know, we were coming from, you know, I, I had a difficult time sort of relating in some ways, but by the end of the interview, we were close friends. I mean, we kept in touch for a very long time. And so when I think about interacting, um, I also, I think about listening, myself being a listener, um, her being a sharer. But then also, I think in the way in which we were able to then joke about things by the end of our conversation, and I could offer things up that she could listen to. And so I think about, I guess that's what I think about when I consider interacting, this sort of um, way that we can listen and share and learn from each other. Yeah. Um, and then to talk a little bit about my the process, um, originally I, I wanted to talk specifically about this era of the 60s and the 70s and how that era really transformed Harrisburg um, today. Um, and just focus on that and do a lot of interviews with people 
Um, and just by, you know, the limitations of the school year, I was unable to, you know, figure out when I could interview people. So then I got this idea of performativity from my other project that I'll be presenting on in uh, May 3rd. Um, but then was getting confused, but yeah, in case anyone wants to be there. Um, I started getting confused between performance, like singing or rapping, um, and uh, performativity, which is more of the identity. And so like performance, things like rapping and singing are included in performativity. But it was very confusing. So I was very confused, started to look in a new area because I, I had to, felt like I had to drop performativity. So look somewhere else and realize how each of these areas, instead of dropping one, contribute in a different way and can help us understand different, um, you know, different work and, and our collaborations. see what, what you think about it, um, and maybe this is not exactly anything related to your presentation at all, but, but it seems like to me that generally speaking you kind of draw on the orality, textuality, dichotomy, um, uh, binary, I guess I would say, where, where orality is more or less attached to blackness and textuality is more or less attached to whiteness. Uh, and I think that, that that's fine within the context of, of what you did. Uh, I wonder, though, to what degree that hides things from us, um, and that is maybe it rules out textuality as a part of blackness in ways that, is, that are problematic. And, and I'll just tell you my example here that I'm concerned about uh, or thinking about. I mean, Gates's theory of the speakerly text, for instance, um, uh, in, in some of in some of his theorizing about literature. Yes, but he has also been seriously criticized for overlooking or, or literally marginalizing a number of African American writers who are clearly more textual in their approach to literature. And the big names are Robert Hayden and Charles Johnson. Uh, Charles Johnson, I think, is not even in, in the North Anthology of African American literature in the very first edition. Uh, and so I, I, he was really, you know, seriously questioned about that kind of approach. Uh, because he does privilege orality in defining what blackness is as far as literature goes. So I'm intrigued by that, but I also am intrigued on the opposite end about by, by privileging textuality and whiteness. I wonder whether we hide certain things about the way we use orality to define what whiteness means. And I'll give you my example here. Uh, it, it is very inappropriate in, in white circles, even white only circles, uh, to uh, imitate black speech. Um, uh, in, in you know, middle, middle class educated place like in psychology. It is very not inappropriate it is when laughed at and, and encouraged sometimes to imitate white southern speech um, as a means of marking difference. I say this as a white southerner who has learned not to speak that way in, 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 in psychology and in other places, you know, uh, in my educational. Uh, career. So I, I'm wondering a little bit about your privileging of that, that binary, uh, and I don't know that I want to go anywhere with it because I thought this was a fantastic presentation, but, but I, I do wonder a little bit about just kind of accepting that bi binary uh, and, and not thinking about its implications, I guess, yeah. I guess I put it that way. Yeah, um, that was something I had, I had more about that actually in this presentation, but for time I felt like I needed to focus on the most, you know, maybe what was most important. Um, but this um, guy I was, uh, the scholar I was talking about, Michael Eric Dyson, talks about um, how people shouldn't just privilege the oral orality of African American authors, that um, African American authors um, are also writers um, who produce, you know, and even thinking about, um, too, how, like, that I am Abraham Lincoln poem is still so powerful, just if, I, you know, reading it on the page, I'm still moved by that, and the fact that he 
wrote that is still a, a, a you know essential part of, of you know his identity. Um, so I do think that it's we have to stay um, sort of on the edge between these two forms, um, recognizing that orality um, is is a, an important factor, um, and also recognizing that written expression is. Um, you know, they, they're both modes of expressing one's identity and one's perspectives, um, and should both be looked at in that way. Just a, just a point to note is that in addition to orality, performativity, and all the other variables you have it might be helpful to have a little bit more of uh, just a couple of other variables to give some thick description to your account here. Um, so history, culture, power are three. And the last, uh, I think for both presentations, space. This is all about production space. And how space, production space is always crisscrossed by these variables. Mm -hmm. It is at the interstices, at the crosshairs of these variables. So I think, nice presentation. Thank you for sharing. And I do want to say one thing. Um, Marion Dornell was a poet at the Civil War Museum, and her poems actually did work. Yeah, she used, the, they were models for them to, to work with. But Marion wrote her, her Unicorn in Captivity, which is really a lovely book of poetry that she wrote in response to the segregation at the East and West Shore. Um, and Alex, Rivera, the night after he came to Messiah, first of all, we brought these students to Messiah, and Jonathan and I drove them and drove them home because so many of the parents didn't drive. And um, so the, this was short, the, the perfect barrier is still really in place, and I took um, Alex and his mother home to the um, Hall Manors where he lived, and indeed the very next week a young man was shot mm -hmm. um, and killed in Hall Manor where, where he lived. So I just I think the beauty of, of Marion feeling so passionate and so um, giving so much of her time and energy to really still she lives very close to here, so she to interacting and to engaging and to transforming. You know, mm -hmm. um, I think that's a beautiful thing. So. I just love this big picture of, of these generations. There is a question. Yeah, uh, John, can I just ask you a question about the Poetry in Place events? I've never been to one of these um, I would like to attend, and I'm, I'm wondering, what is it like for the, the performers, mm -hmm. for, for these kids? We got uh, a little glimpse of that, but is it a transformative experience mm -hmm. for them? You get the sense that they feel empowered by actually speaking, putting a poem together? Yes, I definitely get that sense. Um, there were, I was going to also include another a video clip of a young girl um, performing a poem that she wrote at a different poetry in place. Um, we had um, a poet named Carla from Harrisburg speak, and she calls herself the priestess uh, poet of Harrisburg. Um, and this girl wrote a poem um, calling herself the, the new priestess of poetry and, and how she inspired her to write. And so in writing that and performing that poem, I mean, you, I could, you could just very clearly see the transformational aspect of her identity in doing so. Well, let's congratulate Jonathan.